Hi everybody, I'm Dennis. Welcome back to The Bindery. If you haven't yet seen my series on how I transform my D&D books into this one epic volume, you may want to click the link up above. But since you're here now, I'm guessing you want to see how I made this. A classic D&D monster crafted in brass, copper, and sterling silver. In this video, I'll be showing you all my steps in how I created this, including the design process, transferring that pattern onto the scrap metal I used, and then sawing and hammering it into final shape. If that sounds like the kind of adventure for you, then stay with me and we'll attempt it together. Let's get started. Like so many of my other projects, this one started out in the pages of my notebook to sketch out some designs for the cover. Penciled paper is a good way for me to sketch out some new ideas, try new things, change my mind, and also to get some inspiration as to what to put on the center of the cover. I was maybe eight or 10 sketches in when I finally had the idea of maybe putting a beholder onto this book. And this cheerful little guy here was my very first sketch. Following that, I drew and redrew the design, refining it as I went, making sure that it was balanced, symmetrical, and of course the right size to fit on the book. I then moved to a full-scale drawing, including all of the hardware that I planned to make for the book. I carefully transferred the drawing from my notebook onto my full-scale drawing, using my dividers, a compass for the circles for the eyes. I spent quite a lot of time working on this, getting the spacing of those eye stalks just right. I wanted to make sure that I had a really good design here, so that I have a good base to work off of for all the metalwork later. By this stage, I had an idea of how I was gonna do that metalwork, so I was careful to draw in all the different elements as clearly as I could. Next, I photographed the design so I could take it over to my computer and clean up the drawing. I traced out all the different layers and tidied up my lines. Because the design is symmetrical, I could save some time by only tracing out half, which I could then copy and paste over as a mirror image. By doing this, I was able to trace each element of the design onto a separate layer, which meant I could then break the entire drawing apart and paste the individual elements onto a single sheet, which I could then print out to scale to use as templates for the metalwork. For my materials, I'm using a variety of scrap brass and copper. Some of these I had lying around the shop. This large copper pipe is gonna provide ample material for the eye stock base. I cut a section off to length and then cut it lengthwise so that I can flatten it out. As it is, the metal is a little bit too stiff to flatten out easily by hand. So I'm going to heat it up to red hot with my torch and then quench it in water. This process is called annealing, which softens the metal enough to make it easily workable by hand. Yeah, that's much better. Then using a small piece of steel as an anvil, I hammer the piece flat using a piece of leather as a pad to protect the surface. Now I'm going to take my paper design and cut out all those individual pieces. Then I'll use some spray adhesive on the back, which will then allow me to attach my templates to the metal. This circular piece will be my base plate, which I'm attaching to a nice smooth clean piece of brass. The eye stock base gets attached to my piece of copper, and I got a little bit ahead of myself and attached the head piece and carapace piece before I was ready. You'll see how I have to remove those later. In order to give this piece a sculptural 3D look, I want to emboss the copper. I'll use this little steel tool that I made that has a rounded end, and I'll start by making a dent through the back of the piece to mark the position of each of the 10 eyes. With those marked, I'm gonna use this small piece of bronze bushing to further emboss the eyes so that they each make a dome on the other side. I'm no metalsmith, I'm just using improvised tools here but it seems to be working pretty well. That's done a pretty good job, I'm happy with that. So now I'll move on to working on the eye stocks themselves. For this, I'm using another tool that I made. This tool is more of a straight edge, but it's a bit rounded off as well. I first define the shape of the eye stock down the center and then work perpendicular to that to give it a little bit more volume and depth. I then flip it over and using the same tool, define the edges. That first eye stock looks pretty good, so I'm just gonna take my time and work my way all around the piece and form all 10 of them. I didn't know it at the time, but this technique is actually called repoussé. I really quite like it, and I think I'll try and use it more in the future. With all the eye stocks defined, it's time to cut everything out. I'll be using my jeweler saw with a very fine tooth blade and a bit of candle wax to lubricate it. 
Then it's just a matter of taking my time and carefully working my way all around the perimeter of all the eye stalks. Now having done that, I flipped it over and noticed that I hadn't done a very good job of following my initial pattern. So I'm just going to go over it all again and get all the places that I missed. Try and make it look a little bit more delicate and graceful. Because beholders are delicate and graceful, right? I'll do a little test filing on this eyeball here. Eyeball? Eye? Uh, is it called an eyeball? It's, yeah, a socket. Um, I think I'll call it a socket. I'll do a little test filing on this socket here, and I really like the way that the file has rounded over those sawn edges and create a really beady little dome. This is going to be a beady-eyed beholder. So now that I know that that's going to work, I'll take the time to saw out all those little fine details. After that, it's a lot of delicate filing to get everything shaped. On the outside curves, I use a flat file to round everything over, and on the inside edges, a half-round file does a good job. So with this headpiece for the beholder, I decided that I wanted to give it a textured hammered pattern to better match the hardware that's going to be on the rest of the book. So I cut it off the larger sheet, and then to both anneal it and remove the paper pattern, I turned to my torch again and heated it up to red hot. A little quench in water cools it down and softens the metal. With the metal annealed, it's a simple matter of striking it repeatedly with the rounded end of the ball peen hammer. What I'm left with is a brass potato chip with a nice dimpled finish. Once again, my piece of leather is going to protect the metal while I flatten it out with the hammer. With the metal all textured, I can reattach the pattern and start working on the central eye. I'm going to use this brass plumbing fitting as a negative die, which also makes them look strangely familiar. And I'll use this barrel shaped bearing as a flat positive die. I carefully line those up in the vise and then give it a quarter turn to make the initial impression. Now brass has the property that it actually gets harder the more that you work it, so I don't want to press this too far because it could crack the metal. Instead I'll take it out of the vise, anneal it once again, and then put it back in to give it another go. Another quarter turn of the vise has it looking really good. I'll just flatten out the warp with the hammer and move on to the next step. Next I want to work on raising the central pupil of the eye. Another brass fitting is going to be my negative die here. And I'll use my rounded tool from earlier as my positive die. I'll line that up carefully and make an initial impression. And then once I've checked it to make sure it's in the right spot, I'll hammer it fully home. Third time's the charm for gluing on this pattern. I'm going to cut out the central eye so that I can line up the template with the eye that I've already raised in the metal. Then it's just a matter of cutting out the outline. I'll go around once to remove the bulk of the material and then make a second pass to cut out all the finer details. So all this work that I've done on the central eye has created a bit of a problem because it doesn't sit flat on the base. So what I'm going to do is actually cut out a space through the base to leave room for the eye. I'll mark it with a sharpie, and then with a little bit of a twist, I can mark the spot where I need to make the cutout. I'll measure the eye so that I know how big of a hole to make, and then I'll mark that onto the base plate. To cut it out, I make a pilot hole with my drill, and then passing the saw blade through that hole, I can cut out the center. While I'm at it, I'm going to do the same thing to the beholder's mouth. So those two pieces are sitting together fairly well now, but I want to contour the headpiece so that it fits around the eye stalks. I mark all the areas where I want the contours to be, 
and then I'll work away with my rounded tool to make a rippled wavy effect around the perimeter of the headpiece. And finally I'll give that hammered finish a little bit of a touch up along the edges. So to create some contrast for the beholder's eye stalks, I'm going to make a base plate for it. I'm just going to cut out the circle that I put on this flat smooth brass. The size looks good, but you can see that the initial hole that I'd marked is a little bit off center. So I remark that and then cut it out. It's kneeling time again, so I break out the torch and burn off all that paper. And now I can work on that other piece of copper to make the forehead carapace. I'll give that a quick hammered finish as well and then reapply the pattern. And like the eye stalks, I want to give this some contour and depth, so I'm going to mark where I want to raise some details for the eyebrow. And just like with the eye stalks, I use the same tool to work from the back of the piece to create the contours on the other side. On the other side, I use the hammer and a piece of leather to just define that a little bit better. And then cut the entire thing out with the fret saw. A little bit of work with the files to tidy up the edges and that carapace piece is done. Okay, it's time to start working on the teeth for this beast. He's got a bit of a toothless grin right now and I want to change that. I draw in the teeth and then finish those off with some gums. These will make a template which I can then apply to the metal, which in this case is genuine sterling silver. I wanted to use something that had very high contrast and silver is a very bright metal. I think it's going to work great. I cut out the jaws and then glue them down to the silver. Now to make sure that these teeth look super sharp and nasty, I'm actually going to cut them using scissors. Anyone who's ever worked with sheet metal knows that a cut edge is razor sharp. So I think this is going to give an excellent look for this beholder. All right, those are nasty. That's going to be really good. Unfortunately for me, I also just gave it a weapon. Ow, this thing bites. The non-pointy bits get cut out with a fret saw. And then what do you know? I made beholder dentures. I want the central portion of the eye to have a mirror finish. So I work my way up from 120 grit sandpaper all the way to 800. And then give it a final polish with 4.0 steel wool. To create the dark slit pupil of the eye, I'm actually going to use negative space. I'll start by cutting a tiny hole through the back of the piece in the center of the eye, and then using my finest fret saw blade, I cut out the pupil carefully. This slit is too small for even my finest file, so I use the saw itself to refine the edges. That's roughed in pretty well. I'll wind up doing a little bit of off-camera work to make that perfect. To really set off this beholder, I'm going to use the same sterling silver to create the white of the central eye. I carefully measure the diameter and then mark the circle into the silver. The central pupil is a little bit off-center by design, so I'll measure that carefully and mark that on as well. I'll then cut out the negative space in the center and finish off by cutting out the edges. I'll give that a test fit. It's looking quite good, so let's carry on. I'll clean up the base plate a little bit to get rid of some of the patina from the heat treatment, and then I'll use a Sharpie to mark around the perimeter to lay out my edge decoration. I first scribe a line just around the perimeter, and then believe it or not, I did some actual math to divide the perimeter into 48 equal units. I set my calipers to my calculated distance for each segment, and what do you know, it worked. I know I'm as surprised as you are. I use my fret saw to cut in each of those marks, and that will allow me to guide my triangular file to make a little V-notch at each spot. In between those notches, I use a round file to create a small crescent. I 
really like how that's looking, so I'm going to take my time and carefully file that in all the way around the perimeter. All that's left is a final polish and the base plate is done. These little brass nails are going to serve a dual purpose for the escutcheon. Their practical purpose will be to attach it to the cover of the book, but the polished brass heads of the nails will create the pupils for each of the 10 eye stalks. I file a small flat on each of the eye sockets, then using a punch I'll make a small impression that will guide my drill bit to make the holes. With those all drilled, I can mark where I need to make the corresponding holes in the base plate. I'll mark those with a punch and then drill out all the holes. It's time to head outside and use some stinky chemicals to make a patina on these copper elements. I'm using a solution of liver of sulfur, which smells really strongly of rotten eggs. If you're going to try this yourself, I highly recommend that you do it outdoors. Just a few minutes in the solution gives the copper a really dark patina. I'll neutralize those in a solution of baking soda and water. Give them a rinse with a garden hose, and then take a moment to admire my handiwork before heading back down to the workshop for final assembly. I'm going to use epoxy to bond these pieces together. I considered soldering these, but I don't really have the skills for that, and I don't want to risk ruining all of my hard work, so epoxy it is. I use a toothpick to carefully apply the epoxy just where I need it, and then carefully put the teeth in place. As you can see, I wasn't quite careful enough. I made a little bit of a mess with the epoxy, but I can clean that up easily with some acetone on a rag. This is a five minute epoxy, so I have to work quickly before it sets up. I'll put a generous amount of adhesive on the base, then attach the headpiece, getting it in place and then securing it with a spring clamp. While that's setting up, I can very, very carefully put some epoxy in the base of the eye, and then carefully put the eye ring in place. Lastly, I'll put the forehead carapace in place, position that carefully, put on a spring clamp, and then let everything set. So about an hour has gone by now. The epoxy should have cured, so let's take a look. I really like how that sloping brow piece has changed the appearance of the beholder and make him look really angry. And of course, I love how those razor sharp silver teeth have transformed what was at first a kind of goofy grin to something really menacing. And I think the contrast between the bright base plate and the dark patina on those eye stalks makes them really stand out and pop. Now we'll fast forward here and you can see the finished product, but if you're interested in seeing how I made this D&D tome, then check out my four part playlist, I promise you won't regret it. If you enjoyed watching me bring this beholder to life, then please give the video a like and maybe check out my video on how I made all the brass hardware on my gothic medieval binding. If you'd like to see more of this sort of content, then maybe subscribe to the channel and click the little bell so you get notifications from my new videos. Until then, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.